um, westerns or films or series or even parodies of westerns of series, you'd sometimes have the, the main character being someone who was running for a law and when they went into town, there would be sometimes there would be people would look at a poster tapped to a tree or on a wall and look at them and in the po and realize that's the same person. And what was on the poster? Wanted, dead or alive. In many ways, that's what was happening to Elijah. Elijah was wanted, preferably alive, so Jezebel could kill him herself, but I'm sure she wouldn't have been too worried if someone else had done it for her. Just before the reading we heard, Elijah has been, through the power of God, able to show the power of God. We're in Israel and what we would call Israel these days has split into two different countries. One's Israel, the area of Israel, and the other one's the, the area of Judah. And the area of Israel is ruled by King Ahab at this point. And Ahab has fallen away from worshipping the one true God. And that's, in the story of First Kings, is seen very much as the influence of Jezebel, his wife, on him. Jezebel was from a region that worshipped the god Baal. And Jezebel had persuaded Ahab to tear down all the altars to the Lord God and replace them with altars to Baal to try and drive out all those who would preach and teach about the Lord God or the prophets of God and, and basically purge the land of anything that wasn't worship of Baal. And Elijah being a prophet of God had constantly said and not just said it done other things, he wore a, a mantle of goats or camels hair, um, a, very reminiscent of John the Baptist, or John the Baptist was reminiscent of Elijah, I should say, uh, which was a sign it was a prophet. But God had given Elijah the ability to, to want of a better phrase, perform miracles. And one of these is in chapter 18 of 1 Kings, where it's like a face-off between Elijah, the prophet of God, and 450 prophets of Baal. And Elijah is trying to persuade those gathered. Now, if there was 450 prophets of Baal, there must have been an awful crowd here. He's trying to persuade people that God is God. And that Baal isn't a god, it's just an idol that people are worshipping because they can make that god whatever they want rather than who God is. So he goes, okay, let's build an altar of stone and then, or we'll, we'll both build altars. You 450 prophets of Baal, you build an altar and I'll build an altar. And on your altar, don't light the fire, because that's what we did, people did. They would sacrifice animals and light a fire. And then the smoke of that was seen as being, as it ascended to heaven, God or gods accepting that offering. So you, rather than lighting a fire, pray that your God, Baal, will make that fire just come on, be a flash of lightning, automatic combustion, whatever it is. So these 450 prophets go, that's easy, no bother. And they pray and they pray and nothing happens. And eventually Elijah goes, see, I told you, your God is just something, uh, you might as well worship a telephone. Well, okay, Elijah didn't have a telephone. You might as well worship a table for all your God. 
can do because it doesn't exist. So Elijah gets his altar arranged and he puts the wood on it and he puts the, the offering on it. But just to make sure that nobody can accuse him of doing some magic to make it a combust, he gets people to pour water on this, to absolutely soak it. And they're told that it's, you know, you, you can see the water pouring from the bottom of this altar. And then Elijah prays. He prays and a f the, the altar goes on fire. And the people who have gathered, who aren't the prophets of Baal, realise, oh my goodness, this God that Elijah is telling us about is almighty. And Elijah manages to persuade those folks to round up these prophets of God and they're taken over to the next valley and slaughtered. Those are the bits of the Bible we don't really like, do we? Because it's seen as God's will that those people are slaughtered. I think that was Elijah using his own will to enact what he thought was God's will. So because he's done that, he's, slot he's, he's shown that these prophets of Baal can't do anything because Baal doesn't exist. And he's arranged for them all to kill. Jezebel wants him dead. So he's flee he flees. And we find him in the wilderness under a gorse tree or a, a broom bush. It's the only one around and he's gone there for a bit of shelter because it's the wilderness. And he just wants to die. Because he's weary. He's tired. He's emotionally, physically, spiritually spent. He keeps telling folks, you have to worship God. Come away from the ways of not worshipping God. He keeps showing people and especially in these sort of acts of the, the sacrifice and the fire, that God is God and it's taken so much out of him. And no matter what he seems to be doing, even though he thinks he's, he knows he's doing the right thing and calling on God and telling others, you need to follow God's ways, not the ways of the world. His life is in danger and he just wants to give up. He's so tired and weary on every level. And he goes to sleep under the bush, probably hoping that he won't wake up. And an angel of the Lord comes and touches him. And I think it must be the most gentle, caring touch because this is an unusual situation where Elijah, an angel of the Lord, appears to somebody and their first reaction isn't fear. But a gentle touch of this angel who gives Elijah a cake cooked on stones, it's probably some sort of flatbread, and some water and tells him, have something to eat, have something to drink. And he eats it and he drinks it and he falls back to sleep again. And then the angel comes a second time and again, there's more bread, there's more water. But this time it's the, come on, you need to eat something. You need to drink something. It's going to be too much of a journey if you don't drink and eat. And Elijah drinks it and eats it. And then he travels to Mount Horeb, the mountain of the Lord, the place where God is. Or a, a place of pilgrimage for God. And he goes into a cave. It's like he wants to be close to God, but not close to God. He wants to be close to God, but he wants to retreat from maybe the magnitude of seeing God with go, going in the cave. Because he's, although he's had the sustenance of food and water, it's been a long journey to get to Mount Horeb. We heard it was 40 days and nights. It likely wasn't as long as that, but still a long, tiring journey. He's still tired and weary. He can see that he's been zealous for the Lord, but all that's happened is the Lord's prophets have been killed and he feels like he's the only one doing the Lord's work anymore. 
and the word of the Lord comes to, to him and asks, what are you doing here? And he says about how zealous he is. And the word of the Lord says to, to Elijah, the presence of the Lord is going to pass outside. And Elijah doesn't move. He's too tired. He's too weary. Even though, first of all, it's this massive wind that's so strong, it's even crashing down the rocks on the mountain. This is a dangerous situation because what if a rock closes the cave mouth? But he's just so tired, he can't move. And then there's the earthquake. Well, I don't know about you, and I've never been in an earthquake, but I don't think an earth, a, a cave on a mountain is necessarily the best place to be during an earthquake. But he doesn't move. And then there's a fire. Again, he doesn't move. There's these wondrous, amazing things. But he's already seen something wondrous and amazing that God has helped him to facilitate, which is this wet altar burning because the Lord wills it. And he's tired. And then something like sheer silence appears. Older translations said, the still small voice of God. It's just the gentle presence of God is there. Quiet, almost unassuming, comes to Elijah. It's like the essence of care and compassion is outside that cave door. And, Moses, and Elijah realises that God is in that silence, that peace, that calm that he can sense. So he puts his mantle, his coat over his face because you're not supposed to see God face to face. And it's that quiet presence that gets Elijah to come out of his cave and speak directly to God. Not the earthquake, not the wind, not the fire, but the gentle presence. He's still saying when he speaks to the Lord, how zealous he's been for God's will, how he feels all alone. But he's not alone. God was with him, whether it was on Mount Horeb, whether it was fleeing to Mount Horeb, whether it was in the wilderness coming as an angel of the Lord to feed him, whether it was when he was doing this mighty deed and the, the fire on the altar. All those times God was with him. But God has realised that as Elijah's become tired and weary, what Elijah really needs is a rest. He slept under the bush, something to eat and drink, and a bit of gentle presence and encouragement. No point in this passage was Elijah told, you're wrong. At no point was he told, didn't he be daft? You don't want to die, you've got other work to do. And besides, given that you killed these prophets of Baal, there was other people that were supporting that work. You're not on your own and I'm God, I'm with you. No point was that suggested. God simply listened and cared. There's so much love and compassion here. When people are tired and weary, spiritually, mentally, physically, absolutely spent. How do we react to them? Do we say to them, have a wee sleep? Here, gently encourage them to have something to eat. Maybe even just be a silent presence with them. Because they don't want when people feel like that, especially if they may be depressed, as some people have suggested that Elijah had become, given that he wanted to die, just to give up on life. They don't want or need 
to be told that they're wrong, who told that we're being daft. What they want and need is care, compassion and love. If you're feeling like that, find someone, anyone, even get in touch with me. You can talk to me, I'll listen, I'll come round if you live locally and I'll just be there. I take tea, just to be splash of milk. Cheers. But if you can't make a cup of tea, point me in the direction of the kettle and I'll put the kettle on. If, there's, if, if you've got someone you know who seems tired and weary spiritually, emotionally, physically, make sure they've got something to eat. Make sure they've got something to drink. Be with them in care and compassion, not judging their words, simply listening. And maybe, if it's necessary, maybe suggest that they go to the doctor. But wherever you are, whatever you're going through, know, like Elijah, even where you don't feel God is with you, God is with you. Always. Amen.